All right, so we are discussing the Purda article and sexual segregation and, oh dear. Well, anyway, life goes on. Um, Michael and Titus and Akaya and Lekesny have all presented, but, and Mary Hannah has presented, but drum roll, we're gonna have Caitlin and she is going to be on record. So speak for all of us, Kate, Caitlin. No pressure. Well, I don't really have a lot to say, um, so that sucks. But um, what I kind of wrote down is that, like, the rule of the, like, Perda and whatever is, like, kind of understandable um, as to, like, what, like, the purposes behind it. But I also think that those purposes, like the um, child care and care for aging, economic stability, control of sexual imp impulses, I don't feel like that justifies what is being taken away from women so like i understand like what they're trying to get at but i don't think i still think that it's okay or justifiable in any way um the thing is to come up with alternatives right so how could you have child care in a way without you know forcing women back home right and how could you, and without following the American model, which is if you have enough money, you get high quality. And if you don't, you get rot, you know, you get whatever you get. You know, we don't, we haven't solved that. We solve it with money. Um, but to have some cultural solution to that, that recognizes putting kids in a good environment preschool is important. And also older people being in a good environment is important. So how are we gonna do that? Does that make sense, Caitlin? Yeah, it does. No, I think you're right. And I think I said that in my paper, but again, I forgot to give you my paper. <laughs> uh, but I, you can understand how it would violate, and you know, like Aristotle's meritocracy, rational ambition, of course, it cuts women completely off from that. Um, it has a completely double standard for honor, what women are honored for as opposed to men. Um, you could go through that whole list and um, see, you know, that women, given women are equally capable, the way the culture divides them is not true. It's not based on truth. Um, okay, Jason, what do you have? Um, this is about the outline from Friday, right? I think I spoke on this on Friday already, but I guess I'll go again. Um, I think I think what I talked about last time was um, the full covering of the woman uh, in uh, Islam, which um, kind of right. did thing, but I said it was understandable, and I think that was okay for me to say right. that. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, some of you did speak, and I, I can't find right now where I wrote it down, but um, Trey, you're the last one. Um, just reading off of the, well, I find, uh, it just seemed a little unfair, like, were those actually their, their um, like, human rights for both men and women? Well, so the was it like, like that? The yeah. segregation, right? Is that they're unequal. Yeah. So and, yeah, I just thought that it was just really one-sided. It was morally for men. And they had like a lot more things than like women had could do. Well, they were they were like making laws for the women, which is kind of like unfair that they're taking over morally. But uh I seen it said one thing in here that I was cool with. But it just seemed, yeah, morally segregated, like it was really unfair in how they were going about it. Okay, but I, I also need, you do need to understand that the West had all of this stuff, right? John Stuart Mill talked about that. Women didn't have any rights and marriage was miserable. And, you know, the only thing, so just that little thing about women didn't literally wear burqas in the Victorian era. <laughs> doesn't mean that substantially there wasn't a lot of segregation and a lot of sexism. Um, so 
So, okay, the next thing I told you I would ask you about, I had three things that I said I would ask you about. And the next one was uh, Aristotle on terrorism. And um, I'll, I went through that pretty extensively on the video. So I, let me just start with all of you making comments. And because I spent so much time on the video, I'd like each, two of you to comment, at least two on when somebody makes a comment so you can talk to each other about it, okay? Okay, Michael. Okay, well, my first question was if you could still post your part of paper. Oh, yeah, if I could post it. Yeah, I should. This one, thank you. Okay. Um, and then my, okay, so there was a section, actually, it talked about this a little bit, uh, quite a bit, um, but, well, it was referring to, um, this was under the rational ambition section, um, and it was talking about, um, one second. Uh, to be able to prevent and respond to terrorist attacks, et cetera, et cetera. And you, it, in your paper, you talked about that quite a bit. And um, so one of the things I was going to bring up is um, like the, the idea of groupthink. I don't know if you're, I assume that, yeah, you're, yes. Um, and how you, you kind of get into like a, a, a little bit of like a gray area of like, do you punish the doer or do you punish the, the leader? Um, you know, because I, there was a lot, I know in one of the psychology courses I was taking, um, we discussed, uh, I think the, I think it was the Rwandan genocide, um, and how like, even to this day, they're still getting, they're still, well, I don't want to say to this day, but it took them like many, many years to punish the leaders, uh, because they didn't, they didn't just go after the people with the, um, it was the council, they made the council literally to punish the people that were, you know, that had to do with like the R1 or genocide. Um, but um, so that was one of the, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was like, when something, uh, when like a terroristic attack um, happens, you know, do we not, not obviously forgive the people who are doing whatever they're doing. Um, but obviously, you know, they're following orders in a way they're following orders. So well, I mean, I don't know if you all know this, but in the courts right now, they are going through this for the January 6th event. And there's uh, hundreds of people who've been arrested and their lawyers are saying the defense that they have is that Mr. Trump incited, you know, caused them to do it. So it, you know, it's a milder form. I don't want to I don't want to, I don't want to say, you know, what side I take. All I know is that as a matter of fact, it's going through our court system about who to blame. And that is their defense, at least some of them so far, you know, I don't know how many of them are going to have that defense, but some of them already do, right? Does that seem fair? I, I, again, you know, it gets real touchy when it's about us. It's so much easier. <laughs> it's about them. <laughs> but it, it's just technically, legally, that is, our country is going to have to wrestle with that issue. Does that make sense, Michael? Or we yeah. are wrestling with it. Um, okay. I can make a comment. Sure, go ahead. Just like whether well, like another example to put that in like other than terrorism, but also like if you thought about like drug dealer plants, and I'm actually watching a show about it now, and it's like the people working for him like repetitively are getting caught and only they're getting um, in trouble because of fear of attacking the leader, and I feel like that kind of relates to this because you would think that if you punish the person in control then it would stop but it's like you just like you just keep climbing up the ladder in this long drawn out process instead of just punishing the leader because of the fear that that's, they have that's what happened with the mafia too right because if you try to go after the mafia so okay well. so actually batesville has a witness protection program so people who testified against the mafia 
they have to literally disappear. Their families have no idea. And, and they get all new identification, everything. Um, so yeah. And so that's the same with drug dealers. My, it's just a different mafia or, <laughs> right. The person not living out in the mansion in the burbs doesn't get caught, right? Because the police officer doesn't want to risk his life. It's the person with the boots on the ground. Yeah, in the street. That's true. Another comment about um, rational ambition is that it's important to get good people in every slot in order to have resilience against terrorism, either domestic or international. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, one of the other things I was going to say. Uh, okay. Uh, was how I think that uh, within, uh, not specifically within terrorism, but within like um, even just the justice system in general, um, that I, I don't think that we do a great job um, punishing, you know, going up the ring, uh, so to speak, which Mary Hannah kind of, she touched on when she just commented as well. Uh, so that was just one of the things I was going to add. I guess the word is cartel, right? Instead of mafia, it's the cartel. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. I had a little synchronicity today. I spent the, af the, day, the afternoon with my oldest grandson and he's really computer savvy, right? When he's three years old, he's typing up his, this stuff on, <laughs> and he's really good at math and all this stuff. So I, it occurred to me yesterday, the, the next big field is cyber war, cybersecurity, right? Because that's where the wars are now. They're all online, right? I mean, our biggest threats are hacks. Hacks to our military, hacks. Does everybody, under, does that make sense to all of you? If you really want to be a, a military, you know, make a contribution, get a degree in cybersecurity. <laughs> and um, I thought, you know, my grandson might do that because there's going to be a lot of jobs in that. And then I was talking to him. He's between sixth and seventh grade. He said he he listens to podcasts. And I said, Well, what's the what's the latest podcast you've been listening to? Cybersecurity, if you can believe that. So I don't think he was thinking I want a job in this. It was just one of those things where I think he probably was attracted to that podcast because I think that might be his calling, you know. Like, yeah, all of you have to find out what you can do that is meaningful to you, that you're good at, kind of comes easily. And so that was, again, I wouldn't have brought that up except rational ambition. It's really important for us to get good people in cybersecurity at this point. And if it becomes politicized, right, I'm not going to hire you unless you're a Democrat or Republican. We don't have the best cybersecurity, right? Does that make sense? I mean, it just shouldn't have anything to do. If you're poor, right, and you're good at it, you should be able to get that position. It shouldn't be based on who your daddy is, right? Anything else but your capacity. And that makes us more resilient, obviously. It makes us more stable and then more resilient against attacks. Um, anybody else, anything else, Michael? Um, I had like another completely separate point. Maybe we'll do one round and then go back to Michael. Who, let's see, let me try. Lakes oh, Lakesney, do you not have anything on this? Uh, oh, did no. you, what? Oh, no. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I won't call on you and I had to make sure. Um, Trey, let's go backwards from the order I started. Oh, wait, okay. Trey, go ahead. Uh, kind of going with like Aristotle's terrorism and stuff. Just um, so I guess the government did have more control over everything, right? So as in like um, 
the fear of like them trying to like speak up on some stuff is kind of like a little hard for them, I'm guessing. But I guess like involving that with us is just we stay more in our um, government kind of with like, you know, hoping that they give us good information and stuff like that. I guess they didn't really go through that with uh, the terrorism kind of like with that. So it's just kind of, you know, the government was just overruling everything I would say. Wait, which virtue was it and which issue was it? I think it was like, uh, what do you mean by virtue and issue? Like, okay, so I went through temperance, courage, anger. I went through all those in the paper. That was the paper. With Air Sada on terrorism, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah, I guess I would say uh, anger. But I guess, and then we're reading about it a little bit more too, it said that they favored the rich over the poor. So, wouldn't that kind of like go along with the government? No. <laughs> Don't blame the government. Yeah. It's the economic system, right? That is, you know. Um, okay, so why don't I come back to you, Trey? I'm not quite sure what you're getting at, but um, Jason, did you have a point? Um, yeah. Um, I think there's uh, something that really stuck out to me from um, Aristotle and like terrorism. In your paper, you said that. Um, for Aristotle, the goal of human life is to exercise practical and theoretical wisdom, the highest level of the realization of all human uh, capabilities. I think for that, um, kind of talking about like how terrorism and stuff, like reverting to terrorism kind of like shows us reverting back to our like basic instincts. Right. Kind of like, you know, going back to like, I don't want to say animal instincts, but like human nature. No. That's fine. That's what we have in common with the animals is fear, but, right? Want to lash out, but um, not. I'm gonna say this, but it's, it's, I'm not defending terrorism in any way. But like, um, kind of like I want to like them lashing out. I I, I don't I want to say it was lashing out. Maybe it's acting a little extreme. Not even a little. It is extreme. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like. Um, never mind, I'm not even gonna say it, but just like, um, like you know, like acting out, uh, like terrorism again, like I said, reverting back to like basic instinct and like human nature kind of shows how, like, we might be we might have come a long way with, like, um, you know, as far as like, um, like, um, I want to say like technology wise, but like within ourselves, like humans, like, you know, we've become more self aware about our certain things and stuff but it goes to show that like when it comes down to it and like certain stuff like we're still like i guess you could say again uh animal and nature obviously human and nature so i think um i think that kind of speaks volumes because we we might know all this stuff about this and that and, and this and that but in the very back we still have that you know that urge to to lunge out to lash out and to act out so um Go ahead, yeah. somebody comment, go ahead. I kind of talked about that a little. Um, I had just said like, going back to um, Aristotle's virtues, I, one of the points I said is like, self-control is one of the greatest virtues. And then I said, I think yes, a normal person would be angry but how Aristotle says like not too much or not too little is the best solution. And I think it all kind of controls or it goes back to like self-control. So Jason, you go ahead and call on the people. Oh, you want Oh, yeah, all right, go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just gonna comment on what Jason was saying, yeah. Uh, so I feel like uh, that kind of went back to the whole the, the article we read the other day about 9-11, how it was like, why do they hate us? Well, why do they hate us, you know? And how we're kind of like, how it's almost like a, like a, like a feudal cycle, you know? Of, because like, you know, you talked about, I think you were talking, Dr. Beck, about um, how we were kind of treating them like garbage with, it, with the oil industry, right? Um, and how that, that, that led to, you know, so it's not like it was, you know, just, just, Justin, Jason was talking about like, you know, not justifying terrorism in any way, um, but they did, they did what they did for a reason, 
Um, so that's what I was gonna, yeah. That's why I said we need to have decent diplomacy, right? Our State Department needs to be engaging with other countries, right? And not just us alone, but we get together with a number of countries, negotiate with other countries, you know, we should have every single country in the world, we ha should have, here's what we agree on or what we can work on. And here's where we, you know, we just have to <laughs> leave it alone because we can't get along on that one. Does that make sense? That every single country you find some way to connect if you possibly can, right? North Korea is the only one where probably not, <laughs> but all the rest of them. Um, anybody else want to react to Jason? Go ahead, Jason. You want to talk some more? Um, yeah, I just wanted to go off of Michael and uh, Mary Hannah about talking about like um, self-control really uh, kind of goes back to like um, how we were talking about um, BLM and stuff like that and how some uh, some actions from one side they, they view as like riot and like domestic terrorism, but for some it's, it seems, you know, justified due to you know the history and stuff and then kind of and kind of how like michael said um they're acting out for a reason and you know some people might not see it justified some might and some might even say fighting fire with fire and he mentioned about like the cycle of like you know oh why do they hate us and or oh, why do they hate us it's kind of like when they act out oh no they started it but then when you look again oh no it's really they started it but then when you look again really the other side started it so it's kind of like going back and forth kind of reminds me of like what came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, it kind of, it, I guess it just comes down to like how you said a uh, compromise between everybody, which is, you know, uh, especially now it's kind of hard to do because everybody's at each other's necks and everybody wants this for themselves. So, well, slavery is the chicken, <laughs> right? It didn't start out, even, right? Um, but then, yeah, I mean, what's the point of? It's just a problem to solve, right? And I think our founders, they had gotten in a situation where somebody, I don't know for sure, had uh, blackballed them. So either you allow slavery or we're not gonna sign and we're not gonna have a constitution, right? So it had gotten to that point, there were plenty of people among the founders who knew we're gonna have to leave this and they're gonna have to fix it you know, future, because it's not going to last, right? Having a democracy with slavery is an absolute contradiction. And so there are plenty of people who knew this is, this is going to be a big problem. Does that make sense to you, Jason? You disappeared? No, yes, ma'am. I understand. Okay, so the other thing about it is that we need to avoid, with self-control, we need to avoid invading countries. <laughs> I, Jason, I really think we are going to revert to a pretty primitive phase for, we're gonna, there's gonna be wars for water and wars for resources all over the place. So uh, that's why we need to develop as much resilience as we can because there's every reason to think things are gonna go down. Um, but anyway, so we need diplomacy. The FBI needs um, good um, information. In order, I mean, to have rational ambition, you have to have qualified people who have the skills. You have to have them in the FBI, the CIA, the military, all branches of the military. Right, and then diplomacy to back it up. And you know, you need this huge thing. And that's why I don't know why people hate government. It's just like, really? If all you say is government is bad, you're gonna get bad people in every one of those positions. You're gonna get political hacks, like people who are unqualified, but they donate to the, the person who appoints them political campaigns. So you really <laughs> just, don't do that, just find out. How do we get good people? What is a good person? And again, I have access. I have a, 
I have a place I go to where they interview people in the FBI and the CIA and military leaders, professionals, and, you know, people shouldn't complain about the news. You can get good news. It's just you have to find it, I guess. Um, but Jason, have you ever heard the expression, the veneer of civilization? Anyway, have you heard that, Jason? Sorry, um, no. Oh, okay. Well, it just means it's a veneer. And when it cracks, <laughs> right? All hell breaks loose. So that's why I talk about weaving the social fabric together so it's not a veneer. So when, like, if our country had been more co coherent, if we had more respect for each other after 9-11, we couldn't have, we wouldn't have been divided against each other. Okay, Akaya, go ahead, Akaya, go for it. Well, um, what you were talking about kind of goes with what I put like in my notes. So one of the virtues that I went over was even temperedness. And so, um, and it talked about like the U.S. became a role model that justified war, even when the causes of the war were like overblown and based on false claims. And so like me being a person who doesn't really know much about politics or anything like that, I just had a question like, because I had also read an article and it had said, um, a study by two nonprofit journalism organizations found that President Bush and top administration officials issued hundreds of false statements about the national security threat from Iraq in the two years following the 2001 terrorist attacks. And they just, I was just wondering, like, why are there so many false claims that are leading our country into war and dividing everybody? And, like, is it because, like, the politicians are crooked is it because they don't know like the information because I just feel like if you continue to keep making false claims about things people will start to not trust you and like with the 2001 attack on 9-11 um President Bush didn't really step up like he should have after so I was just it was just a question for me like why is this going on and why are there so many false claims that are dividing us those are good questions. And then you have to find out which politicians lie and which ones don't. And there's plenty of data on that. But actually they were lying before 9-11 too. There were a lot of people saying, we're going to get attacked. And the Bush people just kept ignoring them. Um, so yeah, and then they, yeah, they made a lot of false claims. And there were news outlets that said that. It's just that American people, I don't know, they hear what they wanna hear, right? So, you know, it is important. And it's also important not to allow anecdotal evidence. Like you will find a person in each party that said something false. You just have to figure out what's the pattern. <laughs> What's the ratio? And there is a big difference in the ratio of lies and misleading statements among different politicians. I, I, I could just say Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, okay? She's one example of a standard bearer. And then I'll just leave it at that. She's, she's very much a moderate. Right, a lot of Republicans like her and work with her. So um, let's see, even temperedness, that's, that's true. Um, well, do any of the rest of you know that there were, was a lot of lying that went on? Right, that's okay. I mean, but when you come to college, you should think, yeah, I should try to find this stuff out. Um, okay, who, who, anybody else want to comment? Akaya, did you have something else to say? Um, I forgot, I had, but I forgot. I'm sorry. It just went blank. I can hear. Go ahead, Mariana. Okay. Um, one thing I want to bring up was you talked about pleonexia. Yeah. Greed. 
basically. But basically how that was driven by competition. And I think, I mean, I've talked about this in like, I think all my papers, but um, I think that's something that people get so caught up in. It's like enough is never enough, you know? And um, obviously that's what greed means. But then how it said like greed and flaunting of wealth leads to more terrorist attacks. And it's like one of the main causes of them. And then, um, then I thought that was interesting where it was said, wealthy citizens typically use ter terrorism for their political or personal wealth. And that was something that just kind of stuck out to me. Cause I mean, I feel like not just terrorism, but kind of everything, but anyways. Um, but my favorite point was politics overreacting for revenge in response to terrorist attacks can harm our country, set bad examples and encourage um, followers to do the same. How they hand it, how they handle it typically influences how everyone reacts. That was just kind of my big takeaway. And then it's kind of like whenever there's a crisis in a, like in a school or any program that you're in, you look at the person in charge because you feel like they're supposed to have all the answers. And if you see how they're overreacting about it or causing a scene or making it bigger than it is um, and acting out in revenge, then what do they expect their citizens to do in that situation? So one, it freaks them out. And I feel like that causes chaos in your own country. But then also it just leaves them in a bad position because do they lash out as well? Does that make them discriminate to others? Just things like that. I just feel like the country that you're building like, I feel like it's not taken seriously enough. Anybody want to comment on Mary Hannah? So everything you do is you're creating, right? You're creating your life and you're creating your society's history. So um, it is important. So. And also with competition, you know, as athletes, it's comp competition can help you do your best. But you know the difference between somebody for whom winning is everything and they will do anything, right? And somebody who competition means finding creative ways to sort of outsmart the other person or outmaneuver or, you know, it's a creative activity that helps you be a better player, a better team. And then competition is good because it, you know, it triggers your creativity and your adaptability and your versatility and it develops your capabilities, right? To a higher level. But when it's just to win, then you can just do tricks, right? You can lie, cheat, steal, tricks, you know, you're not getting really better at it. You're just trying to win this contest, right? Does that does that make sense as an athlete that it's a it's a different? Yes, it does. But then that also brings me to like, why are you doing it? Like, you know, the point I think you brought it up in the paper was just like, the goal should be to better your society. And that's why you should be doing it, not for just the win. And it's kind of like going back to sports, like how much are you learning about yourself, you know, and through the process instead of just winning each game. If there's nothing tied to it, then what's the purpose, you know? Okay. Um, Caitlin, what about you? Um, so the first idea that I kind of talked about was how um, it was like at the very beginning, but it talked about like fear being a motivator. And like we've talked about that before in class. And I think that fear is one of the biggest motivators because like especially when it's when we're talking about like enemies and terrorism and stuff like being able like especially with um, social media and the problems we've discussed involving social media, like saying that these people are out to get us and like they hate us and like creating these false enemies even though it could just 
there really be no issue and that creates people to fear um those other people which causes like all the military stuff and like wanting to vote in people who will do things about those enemies even if there's really nothing like that should be done and that kind of goes to the the overreacting like after 9-11 in a way um and I also thought it was interesting how it talked about using science and social science to fight terrorism and it talked about like I don't know if I kind of just like took what it said and just like blew it up but it was talking about like profiling the type of person who would become a terrorist and like changing those conditions um I thought that was just kind of interesting because I just feel like it's it wasn't very like realistic I feel like it would be really hard to fix a problem like that but I just thought it was interesting um so I also was gonna talk about that um the part at the end about like the profiling and I think it was more so like about like the conditions upon which like upon which like a terroristic attack may form um and I don't know I don't I mean Dr. Beck you wrote this paper right this is yours yeah yeah um because I mean you weren't at the time you were you referring to like actual like looking at um like different like uh physical and like mental um characteristics no not like racism or something like that it right if you just make people so that money is what matters and then you prevent them from getting money right you just create angry people right right and that's in the mid east there are a lot of a lot of those people that become terrorists they don't have any future and so it's a combination of fear and anger so you can you can set your society up for having people that just want to go hurt something. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. But go ahead. Did you have something else, Caitlin? Um, no, that was all I had, but um, I definitely just like overthought that so I was just wanting to like bring it up to get to see if like anybody else had something to say because I was like reading it and I was like I think I'm just like way overthinking this or just like not getting it so. actually the word profile I mean this association we have with it now is really bad right yeah definitely yeah. so I just... officer black man and <laughs> you know and that's not what I meant I meant like you're setting up a system where you're creating people who are afraid they don't really know what their future is, right? They don't have hope. But um, I should, I, if I rewrote, you know, if I had a chance to rewrite it, I would leave that word out because it's a toxic word, right? Um, let's see. But again, social science could get used in other ways, right, to, to help. Um, Okay, did you have something else to say, Michael? And then Titus hasn't said anything yet, right? Um, so I was I was gonna briefly mention the thing that Caitlin brought up at the end of hers. And then one one more thing that just when we were talking about um the like even temperedness section, I remember reading about how um there was like a uh like a questionnaire or something, and it was like 71% of people after 9-11 felt that um it would be fine uh, for some kind of retaliation, even if it hurt like innocent people's lives. Um, and that made me think of like, I think it was the very first class when we were talking about like justification for murder. Um, okay. And how I feel like if you ask most of those people if murder was justifiable, then they would probably say no. Um, for the most part, they would probably say no, but clearly that's like the opposite of what, you know, you know, just like lo looking at like how events can affect you know the decisions and how kind of we go we go back on things that we say um when we get emotional and angry and whatnot right well our our strategy in iraq was called shock and awe and so we bombed all sorts of innocent people because we wanted to have this shock right and then they would be awed and they would surrender okay but yeah a lot of a lot of fetuses were killed, <laughs> innocent babies, but it doesn't matter, right? That's somehow not murder. I don't, yeah, okay. So 
you know, we have a just war theory and it says, if it's in self-defense, it's okay. Well, actually just war theory is you're not supposed to kill people who are civilians, right? It was not a just war. And the bishop and the, the Catholic church came out very specifically saying, this is not a just war. And they gave all the criteria that we had violated. So, um, yeah, okay, Titus, go ahead. Okay, so the first thing that I came up with was, it was a specific kind of quote that you wrote, I believe it was in the courage section of your paper. And it basically talked about the military or pe let's see. It basically talked about people hiring employees that were supposed to do military job, but since they didn't have the experience, they ended up basically killing people, killing innocent people out of fear. And it basically kind of reminded me of the Black Lives Matter movement because it just seems I've been hearing that people, the people that were getting hired as cops or to stop the riot, they didn't have psychological experience that was needed. And they were coming probably straight out of the military and they were just doing what they knew and that's why all of these unnecessary killings were happening. Well, a lot of them probably have PTSD left over from military, right? And they don't get, you know, let's just be merciful. It's not an easy job. And so I think they should have PTSD counseling available and actually even required, right? right. Especially before they get a job like a cop. Well, and also if based on their experience, they do it because they've been in the military, right? I see how it's reasonable that they think, okay, I've been in the military. I, there's nothing I can experience that I haven't experienced before. But the thing is, you're really dealing with different people. You're not dealing with people who are trying to kill you specifically. Right. And you'd be more likely to have a trigger reaction, right? Yeah. All right. And the other thing I brought up, it was also in this section, but it was about the current section as a whole. So basically in it, you pretty much break down how the government pretty much played us by hiding their real intentions about 9-11 to attack Saddam Hussein when he really wasn't at fault. So so my big question was, so obviously this was back in 2001, we didn't have as much informational access as we do now as far as social media and things go. So I was wondering if you think they could possibly get away with the same thing to this extent nowadays. Oh yeah, I just, I just think, I think we will have more terrorist attacks. Um, and then that's why I think you should be prepared so that you don't overreact. I think a liberally educated person needs that education to be the one that doesn't overreact. Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, ma'am, but I was asking you if the government, do you think the government will be able to hide their true intentions as well? Well, what's gonna happen is that social media will accuse the government of all sorts of stuff, right? Some of them will say we have to stand behind our gov government, right or wrong. I mean, literally in Vietnam, they said my country, right or wrong. <laughs> okay. And then other ones will say, you know, actually, if, if they're not in the political party, they'll say our government did it, right? I mean, the social media will say everything, I think, right? And then, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, Titus. I kind of believe that, I guess not specifically with the government, but I know when it comes to family, I know you probably want to stand behind them and take up for them right or wrong. But as far as the government, 
I don't know if they're clearly in the wrong, then I feel like someone should at least call them out on it. Like, even if it can't get fixed right then, it's better to let us know now so we can prepare for the future. Well, you don't have a democracy unless you're accountable, right? Right. So that kind of blind loyalty is just what authoritarianism is. Like, that's the definition. <laughs> um, well, I think in theory, you should hold your family accountable, right? That was the thing with Euthyphro, but but, you know, it's much harder in practice. Plus, um, you know, if my son or children committed a crime, I would prefer not to be the one that took them to court, right? The question is, what if I'm the only one who knew, right? I mean, that's, that's not easy at all, but I, you don't have democracy. Um, everybody's got a mother or, a, you know, somebody who loves them. And if that person can prevent them from being accountable to the law, you don't have a democracy. You don't have the rule of law. So anyway, but let's not talk, let's not get it too close to home. Let's just talk about our country, right? So well, obviously our founding fathers thought countries could be wrong. That's why they declared war on their country. We have to remember that, right? For somebody to say my country right or wrong is exactly what our founders did not do. Our country wrong, they're not gonna admit it. We're gonna declare war. We're gonna gain our independence from them. Does that make sense, Titus? Yes, ma'am. And I also just thought, I feel like it is easier to hold government officials accountable, obviously, unless they're your family, but because we specifically voted them in to do a specific job, or more importantly, to represent us as a democracy. So when they aren't doing their jobs, then it becomes, I guess, it's more black and white. Like there isn't the, I guess, empathy there of knowing their background or being close to them, but you've more focused on are they doing their job or not. So when it becomes clear that they're not doing their job and they can no longer hide it, I feel like that's when it's easier to hold them accountable and get them out of office. Yeah, well, there should be transparency, right? But of course, the bad ones aren't gonna be transparent. That's why you need a free press right? That's why you need a good free press, right? Because otherwise they're not accountable. So it's a, it's a complex process. Um, all right. So the main thing there was we could just go through all those virtues and they all relate and they're all related to trying to form a middle class, trying to get people to be stable and to trust each other and to depend on each other and to work together. Um, and then fear, right? People need to be trustworthy and to trust each other. Sometimes you have people who are trusted who are not trustworthy. Sometimes you have people who are trustworthy who are not trusted, right? And then the fear of death blows up our deficit, makes us weaker, gives us less money to educate the next generation. They're incompetent. They can't do the cybersecurity we need. We become less stable and less resilient against terrorism. So what I'm trying to get you to do is to think systematically, right? All of these things are interconnected. And then if you habitually learn how to think systematically, then every time an issue comes up, you're gonna know it's complicated. And then you're gonna be able to start speculating and thinking about, well, what are all the different points of view that I have to uh, understand? Like when Caitlin said, something's understandable, but it's not justified, right? That's a really important distinction. Um, 
Even temperedness is really important. Americans are notoriously not even tempered and that has political ramifications. Um, humor, sociability, um, ambition is really important so that everyone who's qualified will get a job and do it really well for, for everybody's well-being. Meritocracy, honoring people according to what, um, you know, the contributions they've made, rational honor. Uh, rhetoric, very important, right? That we demand that the politicians tell the truth and not manipulate us. Also that we demand that the press corps tell the truth and not manipulate us. Um, but I mean, the system we have is you, you know, you like it, you pay for it and people will supply you whatever you want to hear. As long as you pay for it, it's a, it's a free market, right? Uh, but that was, our founders are worried about that, that people would freely not develop practical wisdom and the society would go down, would eventually be taken over by authoritarian personalities in the name of freedom, of course. Um, okay, political life, how to make laws, how to use all these intellectual virtues, practical wisdom, um, and then Indonesia, but um, think about it for yourself. Are we prepared for the next terrorist attack, right? Are we doing all these things? So that was what, oh, then there's a little thing about Tom Cotton, which I don't know, you can look at it or not. It's your business. Um, what about this one? I did ask everyone, to uh, react to that because I thought it was pretty amazing. Like, I don't know this guy, he just gave this talk, but it has, it's so closely linked to my class. And I, I hope, you know, my idea is that, yeah, everybody, this is, this should be the kind of thing where everybody thinks they have this original idea and then it goes right back to, <laughs> to the basic stuff again, right? That religions have, each religion we've studied has its own dogmas, myths, rituals, and rites. But then they also have this shared moral and not only principles, but virtue. So I don't like the ending with principles because people's character determines what principle they think applies in a situation and how it applies. So I do think you have to go back to these basic character traits. Now, of course, everybody disagrees on character traits, but I, I think they are more the way we actually talk about stuff. Um, how identity becomes an instrument of crime, fear is a big factor, and then we need to create a new identity where our tribe is humanity, right? Okay, so um, let me start with Caitlin this time. Um, so on this one, um, the first quote that I wrote down was about, um, also about fear being a motivator because I just kind of stuck with what I had already talked about. Um, I wrote down fear is the most powerful creator of collective panic and irrational behavior. And then it says uh, collective madness. And I just think like, as I've said before, that fear is a huge motivator. Um, and then also um, it might create conditions that allow people to engage in discrimination and massacres of other parties. So like um, kind of like the false enemies we, I was talking about, um, fear creates those conditions where discrimination and like just more discrimination of other groups is just, um, what's the word? It's just like greater than before because we fear the other parties or the other groups. And so like it creates just like discrimination and um, just like conflict. Um, and I also thought it was interesting. It said people see themselves in term of whichever one of their 
Atlantis is its most under attack. So I think that just kind of is interesting how, like, as people, we kind of identify the most which with, like, our most, like, controversial, like, characteristic. So I thought that was interesting to think about, too. Anybody want to ask or comment to Caitlin? Well, I don't know. Do you guys have, has that ever happened to you? Like um, guilt by association or, um, I mean, do you ever get tribal about your sports teams? Um, yes. <laughs> well, okay. Is it good or bad thing? Okay. Somebody give an example of where it goes too far into tribalism or it's actually the tribalism is a good thing well this is more like stereotypes with sports teams i guess but where i'm from we had a lot of like um lesbians on the team so i had people assume that i was because i was on a girls basketball team um Anyways, I think that's crazy to whatever, but that was one example. Well, if it's any consolation, I got accused of that too, so. I don't know. The, the trouble is like, the, the trouble is to be accused of it means a put down, right? And so the, the key is there, why is that a put down? Like, as a matter of fact, it's not true of me, but why is that a put down? That's the problem, right? Yeah, I agree. But I'm sure we've all had examples of guilty by association. Yeah, my son was in a fraternity and one of his fraternity brothers did get accused of raping. And then everyone is saying, oh, you're all a bunch of racist, rapists, you know? So he had to go through that experience it's just ridiculous right it divides people against each other undermines trust there's absolutely it just it unravels the social fabric for no reason um and it, it's serious it's a serious thing not to do that go ahead michael well i think it like at some point you do have to take responsibility with whatever groups you're you know connected to i mean i'm not referring i'm not like not really to the Mary Hannah situation, but kind of to the situation that you were referring to. Like, you know, he obviously, like you said, one of his uh, brothers had been um, accused of whatever and whether he did it or not, not really the point. Um, but I think it's important that like, as an individual part of, a part of like that fraternity, for example, you want to make sure that that's not something that's happening, you know? And so obviously going around with people calling you a rapist is not, not cool. Um, but I'm, I bet you that, you know, a change was made within the fraternity, whether or not that was true, um, as far as those kind of things go. Well, all those fraternity stories and sports teams, they try to create a culture, right? They try to be character builders in the culture they create. Is that, is that true, guys? At least that's the theory. <laughs> if you have a bad coach, of course, that's, Bad. It doesn't work, right? Um, anyway, okay, who wants to go next? Go, uh, Akaya, go ahead. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and go. So I, um, when I was typing up my notes, I was doing it like as a whole, the PowerPoint, but I narrowed it down to like, it talked about how, um, identity furthers a sense of community and belonging, like collective identity. And it just made me think of um, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs because we need like that sense of love and belonging to survive. If we're not on accord with each other, then everything spirals out of control. And then like, we, like we're divided and we can't get anything accomplished. So I feel like that belonging is very important for our human race because we're in shambles right now, I feel like, at least. That's why that guy's defending Perda. 
Does that make sense, Akaya? Okay. Uh, anybody want to comment on Akaya? Okay. Now, I uh, who hasn't spoken yet? Jason. Um, I'm going to pass on this one. Okay. And Caitlin has, Mackenzie's going to pass. Trey. Uh, I didn't read that one really that much. Okay. Who else we got? Mary Hannah, go I, ahead. Okay, so my first point was how it said cooperating to get along with everyone, even if they believe differently and respect for their human identity. We've kind of talked about this and I don't really remember when, but just to like for the betterness of your society and like less chaos, um, sometimes it's easier just to give in and to cooperate instead of having to always be against someone. And then uh, sociability, uh, right? Right, sociability. Mm -hmm, that's it. And um, another one was collective madness. And I wrote down fear is the most powerful creator of collective panic and irrational behavior. And I feel like this could go down, like obviously the terrorism point, but like, I just know when emotions are so high, sometimes we're not ourselves. And so that's that irras irrational behavior. And it's like acting before you think, you know, things like that. Just not giving your time, yourself time to like collect your thoughts and calm down before you do impulse decisions. Titus, are, have you said what you wanted to say? Mm, not well not on this oh go ahead i just had i just had one i guess general overall opinion about it and it was pretty much the reason why people are consistently getting what they think are original ideas or and just to find out they're not as original is because they're probably not doing their research or learning their history. You know the saying, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. So the only way to get truly original ideas and to start improving as a group of people is to start learning not just the history, but where people have made mistakes in the past, learning what the true what truly happened. Like for example, we learn the real reason why we attack was Iraq instead of believing that it was his fault, that it was just a money thing. We can know that to plan for the future. And if something like that happens again, we can call out the government on it and fix it right then instead of getting into all this chaos. And for Black Lives Matter, hopefully once we get past this, we can learn to respect one another more equally instead of, or else this will all repeat again. So it's really just about doing your research and learning your history. That way you can come with, up with original ideas that'll hopefully help us all and not hurt us. There's a lot of historians that are digging up a whole lot of history of African Americans that has not been said before, right? But then there's 26 states who are making it illegal to teach that stuff. Yeah, not a good thing, right, Titus? Yeah, because even if they decide not to teach it, it's just gonna come up in life. So it's better you teach it now so people can know about it and make better informed decisions than to let them just experience it on the fly in which all the rash decisions are always made. That's right. You, you, it's what, it, history is important because it gives you a, something against which to reflect on your daily life, right? Um, and then Michael, did I get to you on this one? I, for, I, left, I don't know. <laughs> Um, no, I, I was going to, I was going to just going to talk about the collective identity part uh, of it uh, briefly and how um, it talked about uh, how identities are tribal. And so I was kind of just thinking about like, you know, do we get more mad that 
someone's disagreeing with our idea or do we get more mad that someone's disagreeing with um, the uh, like with the people who share our idea uh, so that was just like a question I was going to bring up okay so the other two things I had was fatalism is re does religion help you be more resilient or does it make you fatalistic right it depends upon the person <laughs> And then the, the way that terrorists gets recruited, they start out from high school students that are kind of alienated. So I think that happens in the US too. But um, what, okay. So the last thing I wanna say is the good old Lion College model of a liberally minded person, right? That should be the Lion tribe. Does that make sense? You get a tribal identity of not having a tribal, right? I mean, your identity is you're gonna be fair to opposing points of view. Your identity is that you're gonna be patient with complexity and ambiguity. Does that, does everybody understand that, that it's an identity of the opposite of, an, of a tribal identity, but being a tribe, right? That, that that would draw you together. Well, anyway, that's the goal. And our that's what our founders wanted. Once again, I keep saying it because that's the only way to maintain a democracy. Does that make sense to people? That's so important. You cannot have a democracy unless somehow we decide we're Americans, we're committed to truth, we're intellectually honest, we're fair to opposing points of view, we're patient because we're American, <laughs> or at least we're Lyon College graduates, whatever. Okay, take care. I'll see you. See you tomorrow. Watch your back. Can I talk to you for a second? Sure.